it's Jeff Barr here in Seattle. Today, I've got a really special guest, my friend Corey Quinn, author of the very popular Last Week in AWS newsletter. Welcome, Corey. Thanks, Jeff. I mostly just wanted to verify for myself that there were 10 minutes out of the workday where you're not frantically typing blog posts. You've got my 10 minutes. Give me a sense. Why did you decide to create Last Week in AWS? There's so much information coming out of AWS that it's almost impossible to wind up keeping it all straight. So every week I gather the previous week's list of announcements that your blog and other release channels from AWS put out there. I sort of discard the ones that I don't find personally interesting, take what's left, and then lightly make fun of it. The newsletter now goes to more people than I would have ever believed. I'm still vaguely astonished that you read it. It's my must, must read every Monday morning. So let's talk about some new announcements today. First up, the brand new EFS infrequent access storage model. Wonderful. EFS, the service that is largely NFS as a managed service, because the last time I asked you folks to put a NetApp in US East 1, you laughed me out of the room. We sure did. Yeah. So the idea here is make it really easy for customers that create EFS volumes to not have to think about what is frequently accessed that I want to store at the regular storage class, and what are the things I haven't accessed for a while that I can store more cost effectively. I'm always a fan of saving money, but what I appreciate more than that is when it doesn't require an 18-step process where 17 is chase down the wolf. It's, <laughs> it becomes extremely helpful if it's check a box level of simplicity. This is indeed check a box, and you, you check that box, and from that point going forward, and you can do this when you create a brand new file system, or you can, any file systems that you create going forward, you can enable this later. Once you do that, behind the scenes, EFS is going to monitor your reads and writes to your files. If there is a point when it discovers a particular file has not been read or written for 30 days, it's going to move it from the standard storage class over to the infrequent access storage class. At that point, the customers actually get something awesome. They realize an 85% savings on their storage for th those files. It's interesting watching what has traditionally been NFS as a service start to move up the stack and start doing more intelligent things with the data that lives inside of it. It's easy to sit here from where I live at a tiny little uh, one-person company where, oh, if it's an architecture older than six months, I'm not going to bother. But that's not the right answer for everyone. There are a lot of workloads where NFS just flat out makes it, sense. Exactly. And I talk to customers and I read stories online. I read a thread on Hacker News today where people were talking about code and systems that were built in the, the 90s and the early part of the century. In cases like that, being able to make use of a file system is, is incredibly useful. Absolutely. It's easy to be dismissive, but when I hear the word legacy, I hear revenue. It tends to be something that is business critical that is churning out a non-trivial amount of revenue or providing a critical business function. Legacy often means it's, it's so good that we can't figure out how to make a better one. Absolutely, and surprisingly, oh, just throw everything away, take an 18-month maintenance window and refactor it all from scratch is surprisingly non-viable. That is not the reality. Our next announcement is five brand new bare metal instances. Not to be unkind, you sort of announce a lot of instances all the time. What makes these different than the existing body of instances? It turns out that an uh, important set of customers need to run things on the bare metal. In some cases, this could again, going back to some legacy software, that might need to access things like performance counters on Intel processors. It might also be that they've got software that is licensed to run on directly on the hardware without a virtualization layer in between. This might be a, uh, often it's a legacy database or an old school database. It might be an operating system that's only supposed to be used in a physical environment. But either way, we've got our customers covered with the bare metal instances. I always find it interesting when there's a new instance family that gets launched. Uh, first, because what new capabilities is this unlocking for customers? That's always the primary concern. But close on the heels of that is, oh great, what did they name them this time? It feels to some extent like the instance families are part of an undeclared and undying war on the English alphabet. What are you going to do when you run out of letters? We will invent new letters if necessary. Oh, good, good, good. So EC3 is not coming. Uh, Elastic Compute Cloud continued. That remains to be seen. But uh, in the meantime, since you did mention EC2, I have a very special gift for you. Oh, no. I went deep into the, the my personal sticker vault, and I found for you an original EC2 sticker. There are only a few of those in existence. That is in no way, shape, or form aligned with current AWS brand guidelines. Not That, that was when we had no art department, as Wonder you can probably tell. Oh, yes. I'm still stuck in those days I mean, myself. It, it does have a cloud. An original S3 sticker. Ooh. And I'll let you read that one for yourself. No SQL, no admin, 
Amazon Simple DB. There we go. Wow. Enjoy. That is a blast from the past. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. And those are our launches for today. Corey, where can our viewers stay in touch with you? They can subscribe to my newsletter at lastweekinaws.com or follow me on Twitter at QuinnyPig. That's Q U I N N Y Pig. This has been AWS What's New, my very special guest, Corey Quinn. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.